Okay, we're going to get underway. Welcome once again. Uh, we're continuing our study in the unseen realm <clears throat> and looking into this area of the Nephilim and the rise of demons. Just one or two things before we begin. Some of you called me today and asked, you know, if we were going to have the class. If I ever cancel the class, I will have Debbie send it out on that ITM mailing list. If you're on that list, you'll have it. If you're not, you need to make sure you give Debbie Loro your email address, and then you'll know exactly what's going on. If you don't hear anything from me, we're going on with the class. Okay? <clears throat> All right. We're going to continue tonight looking at the Nephilim and the rise of demons. I want to begin with uh, Moses' testimony on this in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. You'll see it on the screen, and I will pray after I read the text. Moses says here, There also we saw the Nephilim. The sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue to uh, pursue this study, we just ask that you would illuminate our understanding tonight as we continue to peer into these things that uh, have great meaning once we begin to put them together with many passages. Tonight is like that. There are a number of texts that we've looked at in this class that we're going to sew together in a needle and thread fashion and tr trying to gain a better picture and understanding of not only these, these uh, the powers of darkness, but also how this relates to our own life and what Jesus did on that cross for us. So please bless us in our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, sometimes, as I've noted last week, that remarks like Moses gives here in Numbers 13, 33, some of the commentators look at this as being hyperbolic. Oh, they can't really be giants. I mean, they're just kind of over-accentuating the, the powers that they were going to be dealing with in going into the land of Canaan. Yet, as you begin to study this, that doesn't appear to be at all. This is not the report uh, only of the, of the spies here, but Moses is recording it down, and then later we'll talk about this in other messages and sermons that he gives in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, we talked about this, that the Nephilim are the, the result of the sons of God having unions with human women, and that the Nephilim are the result. They are the spawn. These are the descendants as a result of this. So they are partially human, and they're partially Elohim. I want you to think about this. When they die, there's a question here. If you stop and think about it, you know, they're not human completely, and they're not Elohim completely. So when we talk about death, their ultimate destiny is a question mark. The intertestamental writings that we have, and we've referenced these a number of times, starting from about 590 B.C. and then moving forward, up through the time of the apostles and Jesus, we have a number of writings on this that indicate the Jewish understanding of this. If you look on the screen, I'm reading here from the Dictionary of the New Testament. Quote, the watchers, the watchers are in fact the sons of God, are bound until the final judgment. That's when we talked about this, that there were these sons of God that came down, they copulated with, with women, they spawned this Nephilim, and as a result of this, Jude, Second Peter, Enoch, they're all in accord on this. They were locked up. They were imprisoned. That's being referenced here in Enoch. The watchers are bound until the final judgment while the offspring of the Ill illegitimate union between angels and women become evil spirits who spread sin and destruction on the earth. What I want you to understand is that for Second Temple Jews, 
the demons that Jesus dealt with and the apostles dealt with in the book of Acts, their encounters were actually with these watcher spirits, these individuals that this is what's left over after a Nephilim dies. That was their understanding. That's where this whole, un the, the idea of demons being in the world and dealing with them are the result of these unions. And when they die, they don't quite fit in heaven and they don't fit on earth. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls reference this as, this as well at Qumran. They're referred to as, quote, bastard spirits. They've got the wrong parents. And demons are the result of the death of these hybrid Nephilim. What's interesting is that in 2010, uh, I referenced this last week, a man by the name of Amar Anas produced a work on the origin of the Watchers. It was a comparative study dealing with Mesopotamian trends and also Jewish traditions. He's the one that did a lot of study on the Apkalu, which I introduced to you last week, which were in Babylon, and they're recorded there, and has a similar history of their, their parts and what goes on in Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4. He did some work on this on cuneiform writings. These are writings that, that they look like triangular shapes, and they're different sizes, and cuneiforms that they're called, and it's a type of uh, communication. He made a connection in the understanding of the Apkalu with what was going on in Genesis chapter 6. That was in 2010. Now, Michael Heiser goes to the point of saying that any commentary on the book of Genesis that's written after or before 2010 became obsolete as a result of his work. I don't know if I'd go that far, but it was highly significant. It wasn't produced necessarily in a book, it was in a journal. Demons, then, are referred to as unclean spirits. You come across that a number of times in the Gospels, have you not? Within the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, unclean concerns a forbidden mixture. Therefore, demons are derived from a forbidden mixture between heaven and earth. Hence the Dead Sea Scroll designation of bastard spirits. Okay, that's the background there. Now I want to head towards the New Testament and Jesus' encounter with demons. But before I get there, have you ever noticed that it being odd that when you get to the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, book of Acts as well, we got demons going on everywhere there. But in the Old Testament, where are they? There's not a lot in there at all. I mean, there are a couple places you can stretch it in that it may have been a demon, but it's, there aren't any encounters. And when you consider the volume of writing, you know, the Old Testament is like this, and the New Testament's like this, and we have all this time, what's going on there? Well, they're certainly not featured in the Old Testament narrative, but what I want to suggest to you as, we get, as we're looking towards uh, Jesus and his ministry in dealing with them, Psalm 91 has long been suspected as a psalm for God's protection against evil spirits. Let me read the first part of Psalm 91 to you. And this is a special text even for Christians today whenever they're going through a rough time. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Notice the designation. Most High. We've had this before will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, 
or of the arrow that flies by the day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. And as I said, Psalm 91 has long been suspected as being a, a psalm that is dedicated to the idea of protection from demonic power. Rabbinic tradition makes this point in several places. It's in the Midrash, it's also in some of the Targums, but it carries with it the idea that Psalm 91 was recited in order to drive away demonic evil forces. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, hey, Don, you just read it. I didn't hear anything about a demon in there. Terms like terror, arrow, pestilence, and destruction were all considered to be references to demons. Now, how is that possible? In these cases, these terms became personifications of demon gods. Now, we have 150 psalms that are in our Bibles that are part of the Old Testament canon. The Dead Sea Scrolls, when they were found, there are 446. Most of them ascribed to David and Solomon. We have 150. Now, those psalms, like other portions of the Old Testament writings that they collected, sometimes they were categorized, almost like a library. There are exorcism psalms, okay? They came across a jar, one jar, and all these scrolls were put into these gigantic jars, and there were four psalms in that jar. They're all about exorcism. They are attributed to Solomon and David. Four are clustered together here. Two of them are really in bad shape. One of them, not, not too bad. Uh, that's the first three. But the fourth was Psalm 91. It's included with the exorcism psalms. Now, according to Craig Evans, who did studies on this, he says that, quote, that the speculation on Psalm 91 is solved because of the find at Dead sea, of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. He says here, the discovery at Qumran of Psalm 91 in combination with the exorcism psalms has pretty well settled the matter once and for all. That so when you read that, we would totally miss this in a 21st century context. When you come across words like destruction or terror or arrow, they don't carry that meaning for us. But at the time, they were viewed as personifications. We have some other Jewish writings in the Midrash and some of the Targums that indicated that. That caused commentators to suspect that Psalm 91 may have been an exorcism psalm. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were examined and they were clustered together in this way, I think Evans is right. It settled the matter. My point being, demons were present in the Old Testament. They're not featured in the narrative, but they were there. And Solomon is given uh, uh, an acknowledgement as being with David as having the ability to exercise them. We've got a reference here from Josephus as well, the historian. Um, Josephus writes on this, and God granted him, that is Solomon, knowledge of the art used against demons, end quote. Psalm 91 is familiar to most Christians as a source of comfort, but it's also about destroying these demons or these evil Elohim. The key words here then, like pestilence, plague, dragon, were personifications of pagan gods. It's also interesting that Psalm 91 is one of the texts that's quoted by Satan to Jesus at the time of the temptation. You remember that? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. Satan ignores the demonic defeat of the psalm. And Jesus does not take the bait <laughs> to throw himself off the temple. He will lay down his life at the time of his own choosing. 
But Jesus has connection to this psalm in this way. It begins with acknowledging that Verse 1 of Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. And we talked about this as a designation for God that distinguishes him above and beyond all of the other Elohim. None of the other Elohim have the kind of uh, attributes that he possesses. Omniscience, omnipotence, omnipotence, immutability, etc. None of them have that. He is the Most High God. Jesus has a connection here, not only to that psalm, but he also has power over these demons. Let me give you several passages here. Mark 1, verse 34. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out demons. And he was per not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Luke 9, verse 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all of the demons and to heal diseases. Luke 10, verse 17, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In your name. 70 is of interest too. We've had that number come up before. We talked about that. Here you have it being examined here, being used here in regards to the disciples that went out with Jesus' authority. Now, to the most high, Psalm 91, verse 1. Mark chapter 5, verse 7. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, this is the demon speaking to Jesus, what business do we have with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High, God. End quote. There's a deliberate connection on the part of the demon with Jesus being acknowledged as the Son of the Most High God. So let's talk about this idea of demons, okay? First note that demons, as we've talked about here, it, they're not featured in the Old Testament narrative, but they are prominent in the New Testament. In the Gospels alone, the Greek term daimonion occurs 53 times. Heiser gives us this note regarding the term. Demon, in English, is actually a transliteration of the Greek daimon and related to daimonion, which is in classical Greek literature, literature outside of the Bible. It describes any supernatural being without regard to its disposition, whether it's good or evil. A daimon de, uh, can be a god or a goddess, a lesser supernatural being, or even a disembodied spirit of a human. Consequently, the term Semitically is akin to the word Elohim in Hebrew. Gospel writers use the term daimon in combination with descriptive phrases like evil or unclean spirits, and so that the New Testament nearly always, when the term is used, points to a disembodied entity that's hostile to God. Like 99% of the time, that's going to be the case. Mark 16, verse 17, it's on the screen. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Now, again, notice the language here. It has a lot of meaning when we talk about Jesus being connected to the Most High, because the Most High, it deals with them. He has total authority over them, and he gives this to his disciples, and he acknowledges as a sign that's given to them, uh, to those who have believed in my name, they will cast out demons. They don't have any ability in themselves. There's no power. There's no, there's no chanting. There's no special formula that they can use. The only thing they have is the authority that is in Christ and Christ alone. Now that leads us to a familiar encounter in Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. This is on the screen. Now the text here notes that they enter into the country of Gerasenes. Now, this would be, if we had a map here, and I don't on this one, but you have the Sea of Galilee, they travel to the other side. 
That was going like to the other side of the world. And that was typically associated with profound evil. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But the text says, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when Jesus, uh, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I assure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now, prior to this encounter, Jesus had restricted his ministry to Jewish territory. He was in the land of Galilee, right, and Judea, this is on the other side of the lake, though. We're in a different area. This is Gentile land. And what's interesting to note is that what have you to do with me? The question echoes the unspirit cast out in Mark chapter 1, verse 24, which was within a Jewish territory. But there's a subtle difference. I've got it on the screen. Note this. Demons in Jewish territory, Mark 1, 24, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Legion of old Bashan, Gerasenes, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Now, the Son of the Most High God title harks back in Old Testament theology and cosmic geography. In all of my reading, I have not come across anyone other than Michael Heiser that uses the term cosmic geography. I think it's a good, a good one, though, if you understand what he's talking about. Now, think about, for a moment, the history of the Jews. Abraham is called, right, there we have the whole history of his descendants. They end up in Egypt. They're imprisoned there. You know the story. They were eventually delivered. They were in the, um, they were in the desert for 40 years, and eventually they're making their way in the, Canaan land, uh, the land of Canaan, long before what we're reading about right now. They had no country. There was no geographic boundary. There was no nation that had land attached to them. They're supposed to get to the promised land, right? That's the whole point of their deliverance. But I want you to get this geography thing in mind here of demons that are relating to Jesus one way in the land of Canaan versus outside the land. And that brings us to Deuteronomy chapter 32, 8 and 9. Now, this is a sermon of Moses. You see it on the screen. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, 
when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. Now, there's a lot here. I'm introducing this tonight, the final third of this course, which we will hit going into March, will deal with what happened at this period of time. But I'm going to introduce it right now. I'm reading to you out of the ESV. If you're not using the ESV, when you read it in your Bible, it's not going to read exactly the same as this. There's some parts that are distorted. I will cover that and why that is the case. Right now, what I want you to understand, Deuteronomy chapter 32, 8 and 9, is Moses harking back to when there was a division in mankind. This would be at the Tower of Babel. This would be reading Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11. If you remember, up to that period of time, God is dealing with all of humanity, okay? And he's waiting for them to repent, you know, of their sin. And we had the whole flood episode. And then later on, it still gets bad. We end up with a Tower of Babel. God comes down in judgment, confuses the languages. At this time, this becomes a division of nations. Moses is saying here that the Most High, that is God, Yahweh, disinherited the nations at this moment. And what did he do? He divided mankind, he fixed their borders and their people groups according to the sons of God. That is, he put lesser Elohim over top of these regions. Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay. Did you ever wonder when you're reading through the book of Genesis, all of a sudden you get to Genesis chapter 12 and it's about Abraham. Like, what happened? This is explaining how this happened. God basically says, after the Tower of Babel, he's disinheriting the nations. He puts them underneath lesser Elohim that are supposed to execute their purview with justice and righteousness. But he will make a nation for himself from one man. And that man's name is Abraham. And he will conquer a land, a geographic spot to put his nation in that land. Now, the second class that we had, startling Old Testament text, I read to you Psalm 82, right? Psalm 82 I gave to you to show you that God... There, in that language, Elohim can refer to a single God, it can refer to multiple gods, and that these sons of God are actually referred to as Elohim. That was part of that lesson. Now I want to come back to that. Psalm 82, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, and Genesis chapter 10 and 11 with the Tower of Babel fit together. Let me read the whole psalm again and listen as I read it. Psalm 82, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations." All right, what's going on in Psalm 82 is God is excoriating lesser Elohim that were put over regions of the world to govern the nations that he had disinherited. Now, he didn't forget about these nations. If you remember the call of Abraham, Genesis chapter 12 is the call, right? And it says, 
Very, look at it tonight uh, when you go home. Genesis chapter 12, uh, 1, 2, and 3. Verse 3 says this. In you, that is Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But it would take a while. It would take a long time for that to be realized. <coughs> these lesser Elohim were put in power over these regions, but they were drenched with self-worship. They were alcoholics for it. They set themselves up to be worshipped. And instead of encouraging caring for the poor, caring about righteousness, they were wicked. And they led people into all forms of ungodliness. These are the pagan gods. This is how it happened. If you're asking the question, how did these powers come to have regional authority? Like Daniel, well, the prince of Persia or the prince of Greek is coming. We know they, these are Elohim figures that he's talking about. How did they come to have that? God put them in power and they rebelled. Now, these are not demons. These are sons of God in regions that have rebelled. Jesus is being acknowledged here outside of, Jew, uh, of the Jewish territory as the son of the Most High because the demons recognize it was the Most High that still governs over these areas even though it's in rebellion. Okay. Now we're talking about the heavenlies here. We don't see this. We're looking with what we see with our eyes. But this is the unseen realm. This is what's going on behind the scenes. This is how the prince of Greece got to be the prince of Greece or the prince of Persia. And God judges them. And at the end of Psalm 82, it says, Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. The plan was always to win the nations back but it would take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for that to be realized. Do you realize when Jesus stood up and said, if I be lifted up, right, I will draw all men to myself. See, that it wasn't just a Jewish thing that happened when he hung on that cross. The design was always to bring the nations back, but it would take a while for that to be realized. Heiser uses the term cosmic to geography to get this separation idea that the land mattered. When the nation's getting ready to go across the Jordan and conquer the promised land, it is going to have to be one. It won't be just people groups that are going to be brought down. It will be powers of darkness that are brought down in that region. And I will show you as we go forward in this class this region-based territorial thing is everywhere. And we will look at passages out of the Old Testament where you can see this very clearly. The sons of God rebelled and they became corrupt and they are judged in Psalm 82, verses 1 to 5. They have created chaos and mayhem among the nations. It hasn't, the sentence has been given, but the judgment hasn't been done yet. See, they're still there. The request of legion, though, going back to Jesus' interaction with this demon in Gerasenes, to enter the swine is of interest to us. Question, why would a spirit being desire to inhabit a human body? Now think about this for a minute. Most Christians, when they look at passages, they see demons, unclean spirits, spirits, all the, this is all jumped, it's all in the same bucket. They're all spirits, they're just floating around. I want to ask you a question. If they've always been spirits, they're, they're some kind of Elohim, what's the point of inhabiting a human body? Why would you have a desire for that? And secondly, upon being exercised, feel the need to at least inhabit the swine. If you stop and think about it for a moment, 
The the story of the departed Nephilim makes the most sense. Being part human and part spirit, they are bastards with no proper dwelling. They don't belong in heaven, and they don't fit anywhere else after death. They're not fully human nor fully spirit, but the only dwelling that they know of experientially is to be housed in an earthly body. For those who think that demons are merely spirits, why would a spiritual being become uncomfortable without a body to inhabit? Nonetheless, these beings are caught between earth and the heavenlies. They have no citizenship. They have no country. These guys are truly illegal aliens. Now, I can't prove it from Scripture that the Nephilim are, in fact, demons. What I can prove, though, this is the understanding of what demons are through the second century. There's not debate on this. This was, this was how, how did we end up with demons being in the world? This is it. They are the result of dead Nephilim, the soul spirit, continuing on. Legion in this story recognizes that Jesus is the rightful Lord over the country of the Gerasenes, which is old Bashan and Mount Hermon. We'll talk about that. Both of these regions, Bashan and Mount Hermon, are ground zero of the ancient world for the proliferation of wickedness and human depravity that abounds. But we have to add to this, though, that man is culpable for his actions, but the powers of darkness are there to foment sin by appealing to man's evil nature. No one will be able to stand before God and say, I'm going to blame the enemy on this. I'm going to blame the devil or this demon or whatever for whatever it is. No, they're going to be responsible for it. But these powers, these beings, foment this. As I said, it cannot be proved categorically that demons are the result of the dead Nephilim, but Jewish theology held to this position until the second century A.D., In addition, when you think about it, the Nephilim connection makes the most sense. What other reason have you heard of why those demons were so uncomfortable that they wanted to go into the pigs? It's the only abode they know of. Here's another text. Matthew chapter 12, 43 to 45. You can compare it in Luke chapter 11, 24 to 26. The text reads, notice the wording here. Now when, Jesus is speaking, now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Jesus is teaching. He's using this, I think, as a parable to illustrate his other greater points, which are not a part of what we're going after right now. R.T. France in his commentary makes that a notation that it's probably parabolic. I don't have any problem with that. But I, I do, I want to call your attention to Jesus' understanding here of how he relates this. The spirit finds no rest after its exercise and goes to a waterless place. What is that? Desert. It's a desert, right? It's a wilderness. This is of interest to us. Satan is Lord of the dead. And the desert is about death. Things go into the desert to die. 
The desert was always viewed in Jewish thought as the realm of the dead. Things die in the desert, which is also inhabited by wild beasts and demons. It's in my notes, Leviticus 16, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 34, Job 8, you can look that up. Jesus was tempted by Satan where? In the desert. At this point in our study, it is noteworthy that the exercised spirit is not at home until back in a human body. And additional spirits want to get on the same train. We'll go with you. We'll go back in there. Why? Because that's all they know. They roam in the desert, but they don't fit there completely. But within a spiritual context, they don't fit there either. It's an unclean mixture. They are truly, by definition, bastards, as the Dead Sea Scroll puts it. Now, moving on with this cosmic geography idea, that brings us to the study of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon's a real mountain, okay? It sits 9,000 feet above sea level. It is the tallest location in Israel. It was taken from Syria during the Six-Day War. It now offers Israeli skiing and scenic views. The summit straddles both Syria and Lebanon, and the United Nations maintains a buffer zone between Israel and Syria there. Notice the map on the screen. Okay, Mount Hermon is marked at the very top. You see it there on the right-hand side. You see where it is in relationship to Caesarea Philippi, which is coming further south. The sea of Galilee is all the way down in the middle there. In the Bible, this mountain is also known as uh, Sirion and Senia. This is the location. This is the location where the original sons of God who rebelled and said, we see the daughters of men, we want to have them as our own wives, this is the location where they came down. Enoch chapter 6 directly connects it to this mountain. Here's how it reads, it's on the screen. And when the sons of men had multiplied in those days, Beautiful and comely daughters were born to them. And the watchers, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us begat children for ourselves. And Shimahazab, their chief, said to them, I fear that you will not want to do this deed, and I alone shall be guilty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us swear an oath, and let us all bind one another with a curse, that none of us turn back from this counsel until we fulfill it and do this deed. Then they all swore together and bound one another with a curse. And they were all of them, 200 who descended in the days of Jared, Noah's great-grandfather, onto the peak of Mount Hermon. And they called the mountain Hermon because they swore and bound one another with it to a curse. Now, the meaning of the word. Hermon in Hebrew and Aramaic is related to harmon, which as a verb means devote to destruction, or as a noun, a thing devoted to destruction. This mountain was, was um, uh, what's the word I want, was explored in a specific way in 1869. Now think about that. That's four years after the end of the Civil War. In 1869, Sir Charles Warren documented the highest temple in the ancient world on the peak of Mount Hermon. 
He found at that time a limestone stele, which was later translated by ancient Semitic scholar George Nicholsburg, which reads, According to the command of the greatest and holy God, those who take this oath proceed from here. End quote. Nicholsburg connected the wording to 1 Enoch chapter 6.6, 6, and they were, all of them, 200 who descended in the days of Jared onto the peak of Mount Hermon. Really fascinating stuff, okay? Now, this mountain forms the northern border of the region of Bashan. I had you read Psalm 68 <clears throat> in your, in your uh, studies. I want to read that to you right now. Psalm 68, I'm reading 15 through 18. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with envy, O mountain, with many peaks? At the mountain which God has desired for his abode, surely the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are myriads and thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in his holiness. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captive thy captives, thou hast received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord, the God, and that God, that God may dwell there. All right, now, so we've got this mountain that's in the northern part. This is the northern part of Israel. It's south of the areas of Babylon and Assyria where we were last week, but it's in between there. And this area is considered an abscess of evil that affects the ancient world. Psalm 68, 15 and 16 says, it's a mountain of God, a mountain of Bashan, a mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Heiser regard, uh, writes on this, and he says, the association of Mount Hermon with Mount Bashan would have made sense to Second Temple Jews familiar with First Enoch, as well as the Israelites who read Genesis 6, 1 to 4, supernaturally, in accord with its original Mesopotamian context. And when he makes that statement, he's talking about what happened in the history of Babylon with the Apkalu. English readers, he writes, centuries or millennia, rem millennia removed from the original readers are largely unaware, unaware of this. Why is this so? In a word, in the Old Testament times, the whole region of Bashan was associated with giants, evil spirits, the spawn of the watchers, according to Genesis 6, 1-4. When Jesus goes over the Gerasenes, he's in the same area where this is going on. I found cooperation with this, with Joel Golden Gaze, his commentary, on, uh, Baker commentary on the Old Testament as well. Now, I want you to look with interest here at Psalm 68, verse 18, compared to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Paul, in writing to Ephesus, quotes this psalm, okay? I've got it on the screen for you here. Paul links Jesus' defeat of the powers of darkness here back to Psalm 68. In Psalm 68, verse 18, the text reads, You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving the gifts among men. Now, in relationship to us, I think the picture is this, of God going to the very place where this rebellion was, he's going to have this as his own mountain. <laughs> That's what Psalm 68 ends with. This is going to be the mountain of God. Well, in history we're finding out this wasn't the mountain of God. It was the mountain of evil at this time. But the, the uh, psalm is saying this is what's going to happen. This is going to be God's mountain here. And you're going to lead forth a host of captives. Now that fits with the understanding that we are all held captive by sin. We are all enslaved by the devil prior to conversion, right? You've got enough New Testament, you know those passages that are on that. 
And then there's the receiving of gifts among men that the, the, there's worship, there's things that are being given to God because of the great mercy that he's done for them. Paul looks back on this and he does something that he could only do. I can't do it. He changes the text. Do you see it? The end of it is in Psalm 68 verse 18, he was receiving gifts among men. In Ephesians chapter 4 or 8, he gave gifts to men. Paul can do that under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I can't, but he can. Now here's what I think is going on here. The emphasis here is not only on liberation, but rather it's on conquest. In both texts, it's more about this idea of conquering. In Psalm 68, Yahweh conquers demonic Bashan, while for Paul, Jesus is the conqueror of demonic Bashan. And the captives are the powers of darkness. In the ancient world, a number of, of uh, stories are about this uh, regarding governments and, and the way they ordered themselves in regards to wars. When you had a conquering army come back that's won, they bring the spoils back to its city. Rome was famous for this. They had gigantic parades. They would, the armies would camp outside of Rome. They'd send a, a runner in to tell them we're ready to make our way back in. They just were somewhere. They just won these great battles. They come back in and they have these great parades and they bring with them the captives. Okay? This, this fits with Genesis 3 verse 15. Okay? Uh, it says there that, um, that, that, that Satan would, Satan's head would be crushed and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. That language is the language of being vanquished because what they would do is they would tie up the dignitaries' hands and they put them behind their chariots and their wagons and those wagons and horses are kicking up dust and they're being dragged along going through the city to all the cheers of the victors. That's what's going on here. Paul says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. That's us. He gave gifts to us. This is the parade of all parades. And it happens in ground zero of the demonic powers who were originally inhabited Bashan and Mount Hermon. What we're going to learn is that Jesus provoked the powers of darkness at Bashan and Mount Hermon to set in motion the circumstances that would lead to his death. That's coming next week. His sacrificial death, not just any death, was essential and would be the precursor for his resurrection. Consequently, the powers put in place in Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9, and cursed in Psalm 82, were nullified by the Most High, but this does not mean that they surrendered their charges. The sentence has been given, but it hasn't been realized yet. Let me give you some prophetic words on this. Here's Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 24, 21. So it will happen in that day. The Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. You know, it's not just justice, God's justice, just retribution on the evil within mankind. It's also his indignation and his judgment on the powers of darkness where we can't see them. Isaiah chapter 34, draw near, O nations, and hear, do you hear that? Draw near, O nations, 
to hear and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all it contains hear, and the world and all that springs forth from it. For the Lord's indignation is against all the nations, and his wrath against all their armies. He will utterly destroy them. He has given them over to slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out, and their corpses will give off their stench, and the mountains will be drenched with their blood, and all the host of heaven will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll, and all their hosts will also wither away, as a leaf withers from the vine, or as one withers from the fig tree." Okay, let me, what have we learned here? We've learned that demons are the result of the sons of God copulating with human women. They spawn the Nephilim, and the Nephilim, when they die, don't really have any place to be. They end up in the world, and they inhabit, they want to go back into a body. They're called demons, okay? But in addition to those, higher rank and authority are the sons of God that were put in charge over regions of the world when God disinherited the nations and starts to work with one nation out of Abraham's loins. They were supposed to execute their charges in justice and righteousness and holiness, but they didn't. They wanted self-worship. I will exalt my throne above the heavens. I will be like the Most High. I will be above the mount of the assembly. They all have this. And so they foster idolatry in all these pagan lands. And we find here that Jesus then is going out and beginning his ministry, and the first thing he starts to encounter are these demons. And episode after episode after episode is given of his power and authority over them, both in the Israelite proper geography, as well as outside that geography. And that what he does on the cross will be for all people. And this becomes the fulfillment of what was promised in Genesis chapter 3. When he comes, he will crush your head. Matthew 8, 29, And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come to torment us before our time? Now, you might be wondering, like, well, if Jesus did this at the cross, then... We don't see this, though. I mean, the world is still a mess. You know, it becomes more evil every single day. This is what theologians refer to as the now and the not yet. Okay? Jesus won the day. It's done. But it hasn't been fully realized yet. You'll hear that also in various theology books referred to as realized eschatology. It's done, but it hasn't been fully recognized yet. The sentence has already been brought down on the powers of darkness in Psalm 82, but it hasn't happened yet. Not completely. There'll be a day when not only the unrighteous of humanity is thrown with hell into the lake of fire, but also the powers of darkness. But it hasn't happened yet. But the sentence has been carried out. Now, look how this relates to you in Psalm 68. God wins back Mount Bashan. This is where he's going to establish his throne, right on top of where this rebellion started, at least in the heavenlies. Okay. And in the process, he's going to lead captive those who are enslaving others for wickedness. And he gives you gifts. Here's Paul in Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. 
when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt with decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Next verse. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Jesus did that. And God's victory over Bashan was realized. And you and I received the gifts. You want energized for coming in on Sunday morning to worship God? There it is. I mean, you meditate on this, it'll take you to another place. And that's where we need to be. Oftentimes I pray, God, take us to another place. We have so much clutter in our minds. We've got so many things we're thinking about. We're preoccupied with tomorrow's dinner, how we're going to deal with the kids on this, how are we going to get to two or three different places at the same time with all the commitments that we have. And we set this aside and we realize. And God, the God of the universe, has drawn us in to reap the rewards of the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. What have you to do with us, son of the most high? It's beyond our time, is it? It's not that, it's not yet. Yeah, it's coming. Jesus goes to the cross, he dies, but then he raises from the dead and sealed the deal. This is where faith comes in. Faith is the substance of things not seen and the evidence of things hoped for. Sometimes people talk about faith that it's kind of like wishful thinking. It's like me when I'm agonizing the night before the report card comes out and I'm, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope I got a C in that class. It's wishful thinking. But when we talk about hope that's within the Word of God, it is a hope assured. This is all done. The day was won for you. And you now get to see the parade coming through the town with the the captives that are being led behind those chariots and throwing all kinds of confetti and wreaths and as the revelation has it, we're throwing down, our, we're casting our thrones, our crowns down before the Lord Jesus Christ because he won the day. That's our testimony. When you think of a plan that is this big, it's this vast, and it involved you. When you think how puny and insignificant we each are, and yet the God of the universe, with all of this going on, you are numbered there. The gifts of men, gifts to men from the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day is a good day. Every day is a good day. Questions? I threw a lot at you tonight. Does it make sense? Yes, Joyce, hold on. I'm just still on the pigs, and they went into the, the water and they died. Yes. Well, what happened to the evil spirits then? They end up going to waterless places okay. Okay. Oh. and we're waiting and hoping so, for another place to get to. So they don't, you know, so wanting to go into the pigs was just a very, very temporary thing and 
at the moment, yeah, it was the closest bodies around. Yeah. And okay. if, if you understand what I'm saying about these dead Nephilim spirits, I got to have something to live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what made them go into the sea? I mean, pigs don't think I'm going to kill myself. And the demons wouldn't have wanted that. It's only speculation. But I think what happened there was these are beings that are not supposed to be inhabited, taking up residence in, a, in an animal. Okay. Okay. There was no, they didn't have any correlation to animals. And I think once there, you know, their minds snapped. Okay. You know, they were blown, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, like our dark angel. Um, another question. So the demons are the result of the... Dead meth Nephilim. The dead Nephilim. Nephilim. And humans. No. The Nephilim are the spawn of the sons of God, parent, and a human woman. Right. Part... So the Nephilim are part Elohim and part human. Part human. <coughs> right. Is that, and then they get called? They become known as, as demons. demons. So the demons are not what was cast out of heaven with no. Lucifer? No, they're not. When we, no, that's correct. See, from a Christian perspective, most of us think all of these spirits are all demons. And what I'm teaching you is, that's not the case. The scripture talks about ranks of authority. Paul brings this up in Ephesians 6. Our, our war is not against flesh and blood, right? But against rulers, against powers, world forces of darkness. I mean, many commentators see that as ranks of authority. Demons are on the low end of the totem pole. They are, are subservient to the powers of darkness. They're subservient to Satan. But they don't fit in the heavenlies, and they don't really fit. So they're not fallen angels. They're not fallen okay. angels. They are not fallen angels. Uh, do you see a connection between the desert desire for the demons to be in a desert and Azizel, who is the person in the desert, the demon in the desert that they put the scapegoat and send him to? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there, yeah they, there's some thinking about that, yeah. too. So they're trying to get back to dad. Yeah, they're trying to get back to dad. <laughs> but dad is not there. Right. Let me, let me make a point on this, too. I, I read you out of Enoch tonight, which talks specifically about these sons of God coming together. There are 200 of them and came and descended on Mount Hermon, right? Or again, we're in a non chimaical book here. I can't necessarily point the chapter and verse out of the Bible. But this whole scenario of what we're talking about here regarding what took place in Genesis 6, 1 to 4, it fits. It's the same area. Okay? Jude connects up with Enoch. So does Second Peter connect up with Enoch. And it's on this same topic in this one particular portion of Enoch, which talks about a lot of different various kinds of things. But in this particular portion, it notes there were 200 that entered into this pack. Now, can't you see this? They're all talking, and they're like, you know, we're going to do this. Yeah, we're going to do this. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's go. Hey, wait a minute. We all say we're going to do it, but what if I get down there, I'm the only one that does it. We need to make an agreement. What do they do? They swear an oath. Now, those of you that are in my covenant theology class on Sunday mornings, you know the importance of this. This is a covenant. You don't make that on pains of death when you're talking about this. 200 of them go into an agreement on a mountain that becomes known as the mountain of destruction, or that which is given over to destruction. And they proceed from there. What's coming is, next week, Jesus will be at the gates of hell and kick the gates right through and provoke them as only he could do. That is in the scripture. And that is what we're going to be examining next week. Yes. Uh, 
two-part question here. Um, number one is the, the, the souls or the spirits of the Nephilim are the demons that are currently out. The re is, could part of the reason that the demontology was so great during Jesus' time is that the Nephilim's lifespan has ran out at that time, so therefore there were no more Nephilim's, but the demon influence would be high, and is there a finite number of demons? Okay, so the demons, these demons, which are part human and part Elohim, the problem with them is, Jim, they don't die because they're part Elohim. But see, they don't fit with Elohims that don't die. <laughs> they, their abode was on earth. So they're, they're, they really are illegal aliens. There's no place for them to be. So they become demonic. That is, they're in service to uh, the powers of darkness, whether it be a regional authority or it be Satan himself. Um, they don't procreate after they're dead. You know, they just are disembodied. And they don't have any place. But there is a certain number of them. There's a certain number of them. Now, again, I want you to, if you're going to meditate on something, meditate on this idea of unholy mixture. Look how many times in the New Testament they refer to as unclean. Unclean always had the sense of an unholy mixture. They are the very definition of that. So, are, you still, are they still around then? They're still around. They are. But their power is restricted a lot more since the cross and the resurrection. But they're around. Yeah. You mentioned that they weren't talked about that much in the Old Testament like they are in the New Testament. But from everything we read about the world prior to this time, way back that time, the medieval periods and stuff like that, weren't demons and uh, didn't people acknowledge that there was evil around all the time? I mean, you hear well, stories. Well, yeah, but if you're talking about medieval times, you're talking about way, way down after. the road. There's always been evil. Right. And remember, evil is being fomented because of the sons of God being put in authority in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, when God disinherited the nations, he put them over these, char these charges, but they became self-absorbed with their own worship. So there, you, you want, what are the problems in the world that are going on behind the scenes? Demons, yes. Fallen sons of God, yes. Some of which are over regions, okay? So there, there's ranks of authority here. I think John's got one on the back, too. So do the fallen angels ever interact with demons? No, said that wrong. Do the uh, Nephilim ever interact with fallen angels? D you mean the... Do the dead Nephilim ever interact with fallen sons of God? Yes. Yeah. They're all in the same, they're all in the same vein. Right, but two separate people groups. Two, except well, they're not people. Groups. Yeah, two they're separate two separate, beings. they're groups, that's right. And they do interact. Yes. Okay. So um, where it says in James that if you don't curb your tongue, yeah, your religion is worthless. Is that the purpose of the ethylene trying to get into people so that they can use our words against us or what our thoughts or whatever to screw up the world? I mean, what, what do they want to be? I mean, they the, need a place to be, and they've chosen people. D you know. d d John, you're on, you're on point, but think of a pie. You just talked about one slice. No, I get that part. They, they like, foment all kinds of evil between men and women. Now again, you, no, no human being is going to be able to say, a demon made me do this. That isn't going to fly. I'm, I'm not 
But they will foment, John, John, they'll foment anything, not just our words with one another. Well, it says that we're supposed to take all the cap, you know, thoughts captive, you know, and I'm just saying that the way the world goes today, we do a lot with suggestive stuff, which is, I'm not trying to get out of anything. I'm just going like, okay, so what do they want to be in us so much for unless they're trying to get something for us that the angels, you know, it talks about the angels are jealous of us, that we've got something going that they don't have. Well, again, so they're... It can't be just good-looking women. I mean, the, I'm sorry, but that... That's done. Know. Yeah. That's done. But what we're understanding is they don't have any place else to be. I mean, I want you to think about this. When do you, when, isn't, when you got, where are you going when you guys leave here tonight? Home. You're going home. You're going to what's a familiar surroundings. Now, what if you're talking about some soul slash spirit that has no home? They don't fit anywhere. Yes. Their body dies, the human portion of it, of the Nephilim, um, you know, the, yeah, the Nephilim, the human portion dies and the spirit portion goes on? No, listen carefully. When a human being that's 100% human dies, do they cease to exist? No, no. they don't. Okay. They, well, they are. So the, the, but they the, don't maintain the body. They don't maintain a body. There's no but. That's the problem. That's the only thing they know. So but unlike us, when we die, our souls go where? They go, they go to heaven. So they keep looking for another body. Yes. I want to go home. Now, you could look at this and say, well, what's the hope? I mean, where, where are they going to go? They live for the next day. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Our time's not yet. You know? Give me another day. Yes. So today there's Satan worshiping religions, and there is religions like down in Haiti, they actually pray to get uh, possessed by spirits. Do you think that those are the demons that originated with the Nephilim, or there's others? When you have those kinds of things going on, you've got all kinds of evil powers that are there. You know? You could have demons that are present there. You could have fallen sons of God that are involved in that. I mean, you, you got all kinds of stuff that's going on there. Yes. I have the mic. Yeah. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> when those 200 beings wanted to descend and do their thing on earth, there was somebody, I don't remember his name, he said it was not a good idea. Who was that? No, no. He said, he was just saying, look, if we're going to do it, we better have an agreement. <laughs> okay. So he was in on it then? He was, oh, he was in on it. Okay. I don't want to be the one. Oh, okay, we're going to go do it. I'll go. And all of a sudden I look behind me. Hey, where's everybody else at? And I think it's really interesting that you've got the name of Mount Hermon. You've got this excavation that took place there. <laughs> you know, in 1869, a guy finds a stell with the writing that's on it. It's examined later by a person that specializes in this, and immediately he hooks it up with Enoch chapter 6. You know. Now, it's not featured in the Bible. Now remember, as I gave you in the first week, why is it not? It's because it's not part of the story of redemption. We're studying the backstory, what's behind the curtain. So someone could have a robust faith in Christ and be growing greatly and not know any of the things that we've been studying here. However, I would submit to you, the more that we do study the Word of God and we see these things that are there, it brings even more richness to our understanding of why we want to worship the Most High God. Which really, that's the end of all theology, is it not? All theology, good theology, ends in doxology, right? Yes. Um, you're describing the history of Rome when they came back with their captives, the treasures. All the people would go out and meet uh, the victors. Right. I mean, people just leave Rome and get her all decorated up. 
This question leads to something that I've been from R.C. Scrolls, uh, the rapture. He had three different parts, but the third part he seemed to be in favor of, which I seem to be in favor of now, is that when the rapture occurs, they're caught up with all the souls that are in heaven with Jesus, and they march in to victory. So he was saying the rapture occurs at that point, where they all march in, and uh, so that, that was his version of the rapture. I don't know what your opinion would be. Well, I, you know, the rapture is a little bit outside of where I'm at, you know, in the study. But no. the idea of it being a victory, a victory parade, I mean, we have this in the book of Revelation. I mean, it's all over the place there. I mean, there's the Feast of the Lamb. There's, the, you know, all of these great ideas here regarding the richness of, of, of this victory. It's happened, but it hasn't been fully realized. And this is the great thing. <clears throat> this is where we're going. You want expectation. My mother used to say, she may, Dieter knows it, half the enjoyment of anything is the expectation. It's easier, greater, greater than the experience. I mean, it's just the experience, you know, expect. This is what we're expecting. And it's done. The sentence has been carried out. But it's not really fully wouldn't, realized. Wouldn't, All right, now. Wouldn't this fit in with the description of the, uh, what the Romans did and how things would go? I mean, it's, it's, it's a victory and, and so forth over all the evilness and the, and the demons and stuff. Sure, sure. They're all I, in captive. I, I think that's what Psalm 68 and Ephesians chapter 4 is about. It's, it's talking about us there. Um, okay, a couple more and then we're going to. Okay, so when scripture talks about we wrestle not about flesh and blood, but against rulers, rulers and principalities. Yeah. Okay, so we know that demons are here to torment us, to cause us to sin. He's our tempter, he's our adversary. Okay, so we got demons that are trying to get us to fall, and we're wrestling against them. And also, these disembodied spirits, I mean, they don't mean wealth to us. Or do we wrestle against them too? Are they part of that scripture? You mean the demons? I, fallen, fallen angels are fallen angels. Fallen angels are fallen sons of God. They're lesser Elohim that fell. And they, they, they are the ones that cop. They, there's a variety of that. There's se several fallings. I'm working on a chart for this. Okay, follow this. So in Genesis chapter 6, you've got a group of the sons of God that come together and say, we're going to do this dirty deed. Okay. And they do it. And as a result of that, Jude says in 2 Peter, as well as Enoch, they were imprisoned for that, right? They were resigned for prison. So as time moves forward past Genesis 6, by the time we get to chapters 10 and 11 of the book of Genesis, evil has proliferated again in a great way. And God says, I'm really done now working with the whole of humanity all of the nations. I'm not going to do that. He disinherits them. He puts sons of God who are not fallen over all of these regions of the earth to administrate them while he carves out his own special nation. Right? And in the call of the guy who's going to be the genesis of the whole thing, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That was the original promise. So the design of what he's going to do with this one small people group is that he's going to win the nations back. But that would take a long time. As time moves forward, there's another fall of the sons of God. They do the same thing with women that happened before the flood. It happens after. And how do we know that? Because there's Nephilim in the land of Canaan. Now, next week, Here's the question we will answer. Why did Moses give an order that in certain cities you will not leave anything left that breathes? In other cities, we're told you can make a treaty with them. Don't follow their ways. 
but don't annihilate them. That is all a part of this study. And that question has caused the pagans to throw tremendous amounts of mud against the church. You think God's the holy God. You think God's really good. Well, here he is telling these people to go in there and absolutely annihilate these people. Children, men, women, and children leave nothing that breathes. That's all over the place. Next week, we're going to answer the question. And when you see it, you're going to say, this makes all the sense in the world. So, sons of God fell twice, copulated with women. But then, also the sons of God that had put, been put in power over the nations to administrate justice and righteousness, they all became absorbed with their own self-worship. They became the gods of the nations. That's how they came to have regional authority. That's the answer on that. So, how, so where do the angels fit in, the fallen angels? Fallen angels. These are fallen, these are fallen, what, what do you, do you mean angel, son of God? Or do you mean angels that we took with him? Yeah, I mean Satan and the third of the angels that fell. Okay, that's another whole episode that happens around the time of the birth of Christ. Really? Genesis, read, read Revelation chapter 12. Look at the timing of when that all happens. So there, what you're learning here is there's multiple fallings of the sons of God. Some of those fallings resulted in demons, which are half part, partially human and partially Elohim. But we got multiple fallings, and that makes all the sense in the world because you have Job's friend, Eliphaz, in more than one place, makes the comment, God puts no trust in his holy ones. And the only ones we're going to see up there are the same way that we got there. They are elect. That's what Paul says to Timothy. We will come back with his, quote, elect angels, end quote. If they weren't elected, they would fall. If we weren't elected, we would have never known grace. Okay? See you next week.